All right. Well, church, today we're going to be heading into week four uh, of our series here as we are going verse by verse through Paul's letter to God's people that live in Philippi. And can you guess what the letter's called? Yeah, look at you, scholars. Yeah, Philippians. We're in week four. Today we're going to be covering uh, what I think is some really important critical scripture, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Now, Philippians 2, 1 through 11, it is one of the most theologically rich places of scripture that tells us so much about who Jesus is, but it also tells us so much about how we are to model ourselves internally so that our relationships externally can be both God-honoring and life-giving. And if we really want to make it on earth as it is in heaven, Philippians 2, 1 through 11, if we really want to make it on earth as it is in heaven, to quote noted theologian, the Mandalorian, this is the way. Right? And all the Star Wars nerds said, amen. There's a few of us out there. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, really tell us the better way of Jesus. Well, this is such an important passage of Scripture, and it's actually the centerpiece of the letter that Paul writes to the church uh, in Philippi. Now, we can't say it for sure, but it is debated, but also believed that our passage today, really verses 5 through 11, was actually used as a hymn that followers of Jesus would sing together uh, in the years after the early church. They actually made it into a hymn to sing together. Now, here's a good question. Why would they make this scripture into a song? Why would they sing this as a hymn? Now, here's what I would say, and I think we all understand this and know this about music. Music shapes us, doesn't it? Music speaks to us in a way like nothing else really speaks to us, right? Music has a way of getting into our minds and memories like nothing else can, and not only getting in our minds and memories, but music has a way of staying there and really never leaving. You know, I mentioned this last week. I'll prove my point. Uh, many of you agreed with me last week. I can walk into a room with a purpose, and I can walk into that room with a purpose, and seconds later, forget the purpose for which I walked into that room. How many of you do that? Oh, it's 100% just like last week. Now, I didn't mention this last week, talking about being a little bit forgetful. I can look my own children in the face, my own children, and call them by the wrong name. The wrong name just comes out. I'll call them each other's name. I only have two to worry about, right? I, I'll call them by the wrong name, each other's name. And is this happened in my house, and I'm ashamed to say it. I've called my children by my pet's name before. <laughs> have I ever done that before? Is it just me? <clears throat> okay, there's a few of us out there. I can forget my own children's names sometimes. The wrong thing comes out. But for some reason, I can be riding in the car, and an obscure song from the 80s will come on the radio. And before I know it, lyrics are pouring out of my mouth of a song I have not heard in decades. Like I had been rehearsing for months. Right? It just comes out of us. Why? Why do we remember lyrics and songs and music? Because music shapes us and speaks to, it, to us in a very powerful way. It just has a way of lodging itself in our memory like nothing else. If you've ever wondered why we sing songs together as a church and why it matters, we're not just wasting time when we sing songs up here, right? It's because music has a way of forming us and shaping us and getting truths into our memories that we need to know, especially when life gets difficult. We can be lifted just by singing praises to God together. That's the power of song. It's why we sing praises to God. Number one, to praise God, but also we are lifted as we sing praises together. Something can be stirred in our faith and we can be encouraged just by singing together. So let me please encourage you with this. Never miss out on the opportunity to sing praises with the people of God. There's something powerful about it. And you may say, well, I don't like it. I don't like the song that we sing. And I'm just to say this, and I love you. It's not about you. We're singing to God. And we're singing as one voice, as His people, the church. Never miss an opportunity, and don't be lazy when we praise God together. Take the time, use the effort, and sing praises to God. It's powerful. 
Never underestimate the power of a church that praises God together. It's powerful. Listen, if our text today really was made into a song, a hymn that the church would sing, then here's what I think. We really need to pay attention to what Paul is writing today. Because it has that kind of power and can shape us so very much. This is something, what we're going to get into today, this is something they really wanted shaping them as a people of God. And so we really need to pay uh, attention. And so I can't overstate just how powerful and how beautiful this scripture is that we're going to get into today. And if we'll just dare to follow the example of Jesus that is laid out by Paul in this text that we're going through today, listen, I believe we will really do the one thing that we're called to do. John chapter 13, 34 and 35. You hear this from me all of the time. Jesus said this, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. How do we love each other? Jesus says, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. And your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Not your knowledge, not your church attendance, the way that you love the people around you proves you are a true disciple of Jesus. So how many of you say, this commandment really matters? And what Paul is laying out today will help us to really do this well. If we truly want to make it on earth as it is in heaven, that only happens when we love people the way that Jesus has loved us. Think about it. <clears throat> Jesus made it on earth as it is in heaven without any power, without any political backing, without any advantages of his own, and without any fair fa fanfare or programs. Jesus caused the world to spin on a new axis simply by loving people well. That's what he did. Jesus loved people well. Did Jesus allow anything? No. Jesus' love was this, and you hear me say this often. Jesus' love, it's self-giving, it's co-suffering, and it's radically forgiving. Those three things caused the world to spin on a new axis. And I would dare to say this, as people who follow him and confess him as Lord, if we just do that, we'll keep the world spinning on the axis that Jesus started. Self-giving, co-suffering, radically <clears throat> forgiving. This is what Paul gives us in the text that we're going to study today, how to actually live the way that Jesus lived. He gives us what it looks like, and he gives us what it doesn't look like. This is where we're going to be headed today. And so that we can understand, uh, I think, greatly what Paul is getting at, let's not just jump into the scripture today. Let's do a little bit of a refresher, a little bit of a reminder, because I believe this context matters when you read scripture. Don't just jump into the middle of a letter. Let, let's kind of remind ourselves of what's going on here. And by the way, if you're new today, listen, we're going to all be on the same page. And we all just confessed earlier, we can walk into a room and forget why we walked into it, right? We can forget what we talked about last week. I can forget by Monday what I talked about on Sunday, right? So we need to be refreshed and reminded. So let's give ourselves a little context about what Paul is writing to these people living in the Roman colony of Philippi. So Paul writes this letter to the church, understand, He's not writing from a church. He's not writing from a happy place. He's writing while he's in prison. He's actually under house arrest. A little different than like being in a, a jail with a bunch of other people. Paul's under house arrest. Not like we think about house arrest today. He's not in his own house, right? He's actually in a house that they're forcing him to stay in. Not only are they forcing him to stay in that house, they're forcing him to pay for the things in that house. He has to buy his own food. He has to pay his own rent. And if you are in jail or you're under house arrest, you cannot have a thriving career while you're in there. So Paul has to depend on people, fellow believers, to send him help and care that he needs, food and money to pay the rent and do the things he needs to do, right? Just to live and exist. He has to depend on others. These imperial guards that are guarding Paul around the clock, listen, whatever guard is guarding him at the time, that's Paul's roommate. These guards live with Paul 24 hours a day. He's either chained, chained to them, the wall, or the floor most of the time. And if you think about Paul's circumstance, Paul was powerless to do anything to change his current circumstance. He was powerless to do anything. And his circumstance <coughs> that he didn't ask for, if you think about it, being under house arrest, this circumstance prevented Paul from doing the one thing that he desperately wanted to do. Paul wanted to preach the gospel in Rome, but he couldn't preach the gospel in Rome. Why? 
Yeah, because he was under house arrest. Paul knew he was supposed to preach the gospel, make it on earth or in Rome as it is in heaven, but he couldn't do it because the circumstance prevented him. Listen, when you know what you're supposed to be doing, but your circumstance prevents you from doing that, that is a formula for frustration. That is a formula for being angry about what's happening in your life. Paul had every reason to be frustrated, even to be frustrated with God. God, you called me to do this. I'm being prevented from doing it. Why aren't you doing something about it? This could have been Paul's attitude. And then on top of this frustrating circumstance, believers in Jesus, fellow preachers of the gospel alongside Paul, who were supposed to be on the same team as Paul, right? They were supposed to be in and being for him and praying for him. Instead, they're actually rooting against Paul while he's in prison. They're saying, Paul, you deserve to be in jail. You deserve to be in prison. Listen, and we're glad that you're there. Now, that's kind of crazy because usually Christians are never judgy of each other, are we? We're never mean-spirited. We would never get satisfaction from someone else being miserable, would we? Said no one ever, right? Christians can be some of the most mean-spirited and judgy people ever, can't we? This could have frustrated Paul even more. So not only is his circumstance preventing him from what he's doing, now you got people who are supposed to be on the same team as Paul cheering <clears throat> against him. How does Paul respond to this? How would you respond to this? Listen how Paul responds. He says in verse 15 of chapter 1, It's true, some are preaching Christ, out of jealousy and rivalry. (coughs) Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful (coughs) to me. So these preachers are slamming Paul. They're being selfish. They're using Paul's imprisonment for their own selfish gain. Now, most of us would probably want to strike back. Most of us would probably want to get even and even defend ourselves. But listen how Paul answers in in verse 18 of chapter 1. Paul says, as people are slamming him, but that what? That doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I what? Rejoice and I will continue to what? Rejoice. Paul chooses joy in difficult circumstances and when people are being jerks to him when they should be being nice to him. Paul says, if me being drugged through the mud draws people to Jesus, I'll rejoice over that. Paul chooses joy. And you know what that tells me, and it's very important that we understand? Joy is a choice. Joy is a choice. A choice that you are free to make at any time, and I am free to make at any time. Paul, regardless of his circumstance, it's not favorable. What does he do? He chooses joy. Joy is a choice. Paul lets us know you can't control your circumstance, you can't control people, but there is one thing you can control, and that's what? It's you, it's yourself. Paul chooses joy. For Paul, listen. Joy isn't about what's happening to him. Joy is about what's happening in him. Rome can't touch what Jesus is doing in the heart of Paul. This is Paul's choice. And for us, joy isn't about what's happening to me. Joy is all about what's happening in me. Now, having joy is not about ignoring difficult circumstances. Paul never ignored what was happening to him. He talked about his chains often, his imprisonment. And he said it was difficult. And it, was, it caused him to suffer greatly. Even though Paul was treated unfairly by the Romans and by Christians, Paul doesn't write about anger. Paul doesn't write about revenge. What do we know about Philippians? Philippians is all about what? It's all about joy. From the most miserable place, in the most frustrating of circumstances, Paul writes about joy and being content with where he is in life. He chooses joy. And that means you and I can choose joy as well. Now, last week we left off with verse 27. We spent the bulk of our time last Sunday in verse 27. And Paul says this, as he's talked about joy, then he says, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. 
conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, because he doesn't know if he's going to get out of prison or not. He says, I know that you are standing together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. So Paul starts off with these words, above all. Now, if Paul says above all, do you think he thinks that what he's about to say next is important? Yes. Above everything that he said so far, this is of the utmost importance. Paul says above all, two things. Number one, first, live as citizens of heaven where you are. Live as citizens of heaven, meaning wherever your feet are, allegiance to Jesus, loyalty to Jesus, and <clears throat> following the way of Jesus has to come first in your life. If any other way comes into conflict with the way of Jesus, as Christians, which way should we choose? Okay, good. Yes, Jesus. Two of you get it. If any way comes into conflict, I got to teach better. If any way comes into conflict with the way of Jesus, which way should we choose? We should choose the way of Jesus. Paul was telling these people living in a Roman colony in Philippi, Paul was telling these people, you are a citizen of heaven long before you are a citizen of Rome. And if the way of Rome comes into conflict with the way of Jesus, you choose the way of Jesus. This is what Paul is saying. And he would say the same thing to us. And we need to hear this, especially in a political year. If the way of America comes into conflict with the way of Jesus, which way should we choose? We should choose the way of Jesus. We are citizens of heaven long before we are citizens of America. Does that make sense? <laughs> now, I'm not telling you to not be proud of where you're from. I said it last, I'm proud to be an American. But the way of Jesus is supreme to the way of the country that I live. This is what Paul is saying. Live a citizen of heaven first, and then number two, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. What does it look like to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel? He gives us a sneak peek in the rest of the verse, and then we're going to get in depth into that in today's <clears throat> scripture. So Paul says, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. What's it look like? He says this, then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together <clears throat> with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news or the gospel. So according to Paul, we need to pay attention. Unity is a sign that we are conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Unity matters. Now, here's what I know now more than ever. In our world, in our nation, and based on what's happened this past week in our community at the high school, here's what I would say. A divided world needs a united church more than ever. A divided world needs a united church. Unity <clears throat> speaks loudly in a divided world. Everything around us, it seems, seeks to divide us, seeks to put us into categories and into labels. But as the church of Jesus, we instead must aim to unite, to be united together. Live as citizens of heaven. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. What does that look like? It looks like a church walking in unity. So here's a question. How can we build unity? What does it look like to build unity? What do we need in order to build unity? Well, here's the good news today. In the first 11 verses of what Paul covers, he tells us what it takes and what it looks like. Now, when Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians, there were no chapters or verses in it. I don't know if you know that. It was literally just a letter. There were no chapters or verses. It's like when you write an email to someone, do you guys do that when you say write an email, you use your hands as a fake keyboard? That just popped in my mind. I do that every time. When you write an email, you don't put chapter one, verse one, do you? <clears throat> you just write a letter and then you send it, right? This is what Paul did when he wrote the letter to the Philippians. There were no chapters or verses. Chapters and verses were actually completed and added much later in the year 1555. We're talking just 500 years ago uh, when, when the Philippians from when the Philippians read this letter. And when they read this letter, it wouldn't have been broken up. They would have read the whole thing at one time. 
and everything would have flowed very neatly. So here's why I'm telling you this. When Paul says, live as a citizen of heaven and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, they would naturally see what we would call chapter two as the natural follow-up for how to live as a citizen of heaven and how to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Verses 1 through 11 is the prescription for the church to live as citizens of heaven and conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. So now that we're all caught up, you guys ready to dive in? You sure? All right, let's do this. Start in verse 1, and I'll go through the first two verses. Paul says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Paul says then, Make me truly happy or make my joy complete by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. You see how unity matters here and what Paul is after. Paul lets us know that our joy first is contingent upon our unity in Christ. Paul says if anything, if Jesus is worth anything to you, if he's given you life, if he's given you comfort, if he's given you peace, if you truly carry the compassion of Christ, Paul would say this, if Jesus is in your life, three things ought to mark your life as a follower of Jesus. Number one, you should agree wholeheartedly with one another. Number two, you ought to love one another. And number three, you need to be working together. All of that collectively speaks for the importance of unity. Now, I have to say something very important here because it matters very, very much. When Paul says you need to agree wholeheartedly with one another, he does not mean that we are all supposed to be mindless robots who can't be individuals, who can't have opinions about things. Paul does not mean we have to think the same about every single thing in the world. Paul is not saying that. Let me make this point. There is a difference between unity and uniformity, right? There is a difference. Unity is powerful, and here's why it's powerful, because people who are different that had different ideologies, hold different political views and thoughts and all kinds of stuff, as different as we are, and as much as that could separate us, instead to come together around a greater thing, our confession that Jesus is Lord. That's unity. We can be as different as night and day, but we can all agree on one thing. Jesus is Lord, yes? That's what unity is based around. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I'll get silly in a moment with the example because it just makes some good sense. Unity is the understanding. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's Scripture in 2 Corinthians. <laughs> if someone is in Christ, do you know what that means? They are my brother and sister in Christ. We are family with other Christians all over the world. And they are my brother and sister in Christ for one reason, because they are in Christ. That's the reason. Now I'll get silly. Even if you root for Alabama, I will still work for unity and accept your faults because, hang on, because I will still work for unity <clears throat> because who you root for doesn't change your position of standing in Christ, right? It doesn't. Uniformity would say, if you don't root for who I root for, then you are not a Christian. There's a difference between unity and uniformity. I'll say it this way. You can be a Democrat and be a Christian. I know when that sentence came out of my mouth, there are people sitting in this room right now who would not believe that. You can. Believe it or not, you can be a Democrat and be a Christian. You can be a Republican and be a Christian. Because, listen, how you believe politically doesn't change what Christ has done personally. It doesn't. We are united in Christ alone. Listen, if you won't love or associate with someone because of their political views, then you know what you're after? You're after uniformity. Because you want everyone to be and behave and believe like you. And listen, people being like you isn't the goal of Christianity. People being like Christ is the goal of Christianity. There is a difference between unity 
and uniformity. Are you with me? Yes and amen. You don't like it, but it's not wrong, okay? That's all right. <clears throat> if you're in Christ, three things. Agree wholeheartedly, love one another, work together. If we confess Jesus as Lord, Jesus must be the source of our unity. That's where we start and come back to every single time. So what does it look like for Jesus to be at the center, to be the source of our lives? Verses 3 and 4 kind of answer that question. Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you look to the interests of others. <clears throat> so that's what it looks like for Jesus to be at the center of your life. So let me ask a very difficult question. Based on this, is Jesus at the center of my life? Is he? How do you answer that question? Well, am I more selfish or am I more selfless? Am I finding my self-worth in who I am in Christ or am I constantly trying to impress others because that's where I'm trying to find my self-worth, right? I have vain conceit or am I humble? Am I thinking of others above myself? Be honest. Is Jesus at the center of my life? Now, I won't speak for you, but I'll speak for me, and maybe you're like me. I've got some work to do to put him where he really belongs. I bet you might have to do some work <clears throat> as well. And so this is what Paul is moving us towards, Jesus being at the center, unity. Remember, all of this is flowing from what does it look like to live as a citizen of heaven, and how do I live in a manner worthy of the gospel? This is what Paul is saying. And Paul starts by saying, if you want to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, the number one thing is this, don't be selfish. Don't be selfish, right? Listen, to build unity, it requires that we are selfless. But to create division, all we need to be is selfish. What's easier to create, unity or division? Division, right? Because selfishness is easy for us, and let's be honest, how many of you would agree? Selfish is natural for us. Selfish just feels natural, and it feels good to us. There was a mom <clears throat> who had two young sons, eight years old and 10 years old. The mom was cooking pancakes for breakfast, and the boys began to argue over who was going to get the first pancake that morning. <clears throat> Eventually, this began to escalate. And the two boys, 8 and 10 years old, begin to push each other, and the 10-year-old put his 8-year-old brother in a headlock. Things were getting serious, on the verge of getting violent. The mom screamed at the boys to stop it right now. When mom grits her teeth and says that phrase, you would be wise to listen. These two young boys, they are wise to listen. All right, They stand at attention before their mom, and their mom looks at the boys and says this to them. Boys, I want you to be like Jesus. Because Jesus wouldn't want to take the first pancake for himself, he would gladly give it away. Immediately, the eight-year-old looked at his big brother and said, okay, you be Jesus, I'll take the first pancake. <clears throat> Selfishness comes naturally to us, doesn't it? It doesn't take much work to be selfish. But Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Now, I do want to say this because it matters. There can be this line of thinking in Christianity that uh, we just need to sit around and not do anything because we don't want to do anything out of selfish ambition. And sometimes that can cause us to do nothing. But Paul is not saying that, right? Paul isn't saying that we shouldn't be ambitious. Let me say this. I believe that Christians, Christ followers, we ought to be some of the hardest working most innovative, most ambitious, excellent, best employees and employers out there. Do you agree with that? Christ followers, we ought to be excellent in all that we do. Let me say this. As Christ followers, we ought to be on time to work. Uh-oh, preacher's meddling now. We ought to be on time to work. Why? Because it honors the people we work with, and it honors the people that we work for. Paul wants us to be ambitious. He wants us to do excellent work, but he says don't be selfishly ambitious, meaning that your sole desire for advancement is only for yourself, and it doesn't have anything else or any thought of how my advancement or gaining more could help other people. If I'm only thinking about myself in the place that I work and in my ambition, then I am being selfishly ambitious. 
ambitious. Now, here's the danger when you are selfishly ambitious. When our eyes are only on ourselves, we will miss being able to see the needs and meet the needs of others because we're only looking at us. I think Paul would say it this way in Colossians 3, 17. He actually does say it this way. And whatever you do, <clears throat> whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Everything we do ought to be done in the name of Jesus. And it ought to be selfless instead of selfish. Are you with me? This is what Paul is saying. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. When someone is conceited, listen, they are thinking too much of themselves and often thinking too highly of themselves. Conceited people believe they are genuinely better than other people because of the way they think and the way that they believe. And let me ask you this question about being conceited. How did Jesus feel about the Pharisees and religious leaders who were conceited and thought they were better than others based on their heritage, beliefs, and race? He did not think highly of them. I'll answer the question for you. Paul wants us to know selfish ambition and vain conceit work against the unity we are called to create together. We must work hard to put selfish ambition and vain conceit away. What would Paul say when we're conceited and we think too highly of ourselves? This makes me laugh because of how blunt Paul is. Listen to Galatians chapter 6. I'll start in verse 2. Paul says this, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're fooling yourself. Why? You're not that important. I love that so much. That's a great reminder to us. We think the world revolves around us, and Paul says, no, 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 you're not that important. Jesus doesn't revolve around you. You should revolve around Him. Selfish ambition and vain conceit keep Jesus from being at the center of our lives. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, Paul says, value others above yourselves, not looking out for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Paul says, put away Selfish ambition and vain conceit. But Paul says, I want you to pick up humility. Humility. Value others above yourself. Now, please take note here. It's important. Paul isn't saying that humility is found in not taking care of yourself, not caring for your own welfare, or not having interest in your life. That is not what Paul is saying. Paul would say, take care of yourself. Be ambitious. Have interests but never have those things at the expense of others. That's what he would say. Humility, be humble. I've heard it said this way, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Humility is just thinking of yourself less. That's humility. Selfish ambition and vain conceit bring division. Why? Because we're primarily thinking of ourselves. But humility builds unity. Why? Because we're primarily thinking of and serving others. Humility is key and critical. David Guzik, uh, in researching this week and preparing for the message, he had this really powerful thought on what Paul is saying here if people really walked in humility. I put the quote on the screen because I really want you to see it. This is so powerful to consider. Listen, he says this. He says, if I consider you above me and you consider me above you, then a beautiful, thing's ha a beautiful thing happens. Now we have a community where everyone is looked up to and no one is looked down on. Isn't that beautiful? And this is why the early church was so effective. Because everyone treated each other as equals. This is what it's supposed to be. That's making it on earth as it is in heaven. And so now we all need to understand when Paul writes about having humility, thinking about others above yourself, serving others, putting away selfish ambition. When Paul is writing this in the first century, you need to know these Christian virtues would not have been seen as virtues in the Roman world. They would have been seen as weak and degrading and below you to even consider these things. These would not have been virtues in the first century. Strength and mattering and making a difference in the first century, and sadly, even today, is thought this. You have to be the strongest. You have to be the loudest. You have to be the smartest. You have to impose your will on others in order to be a really good leader and get things done. Do whatever you have to do in order to be superior to others. 
This was the way of the first century and sadly even today. In the secular mind in the ancient world, when you stoop to serve someone, when you stoop to serve someone, they thought you only did that if you had to, if you were forced to, or if it was your position in life. No one would voluntarily be humble. No one would voluntarily serve someone. So why would Paul write this? This is why Paul would write this. Because we cannot allow our culture to determine what life to the full really looks like. We can't allow culture and even country to determine where life to the full comes from. Culture and and country isn't Lord. Jesus is Lord. And He is what determines where life to the full comes from. If you want to build unity, you want to live in a manner that's worthy of the gospel, Paul says this, don't strive to have the mind of culture. Instead, strive to have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, this is the part that's believed to be the hymn. Starting in verse 5, Paul says, you must have the same attitude, the same mind that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Beautiful, beautiful Scripture. And remember, this Scripture is flowing from how to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Gospel and how to build unity. Paul would say this, the best way to live worthy of the Gospel and be like the one is this, is to be like the one who is the Gospel, Jesus Himself. How can we be like Jesus? Quickly, let me move through these verses. Paul says, you must have the same attitude that Jesus had, the same mind. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, he took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. Paul first lets us know something very important about Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus is fully God. Why would Paul want us to know this? He wants us to know it for a lot of reasons, but primarily in context, he wants us to know it for this reason. Even though Jesus was fully God, he didn't use his status and his title for his own advantage. Instead, he leveraged his status so that other people could benefit. This is what it tells us. The mind of Christ first is selfless. It's selfless. Jesus gave up every privilege being God came with so that others might live. The mind of Christ is selfless. Verse 7, instead, instead of using it for his own advantage, Jesus gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a servant and was born as a human being. Jesus chose to serve instead of being served. Jesus' status as God, let me ask you this question. If Jesus is fully God and God shows up in the earth, does God deserve to be served and worshipped? Yes, is the answer. He deserves to be worshipped and served. But Jesus puts aside the status so that other people, not so other people can serve him, but simply so that he can serve others. The mind of Christ is selfless. The mind of Christ is also all about serving. Mark chapter 9, it says this, They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Jesus, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? And this is funny. They kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. It's funny. Sitting down, Jesus called them together. He knew this, and he said this, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Jesus says this is the greatest virtue that exists. The mind of Christ tells us greatness isn't found in status. Greatness is only found in serving. This is what Paul wants us to know in how to live in a way that's worthy of the gospel. It's not about being great because of the title that we have. Being great in the kingdom of God is only found in serving 
others. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus would say, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Greatness isn't found in status. Greatness is found in serving. You must have the same attitude or mind that Christ Jesus had, though he was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, but instead, he gave up his divine privileges, took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Church, the mind of Christ is selfless. The mind of Christ serves. But please understand this most important part. The mind of Christ is one that is anchored in humility. It's anchored in humility. David Gusick also writes this, talking about how humble Jesus was throughout his entire life. Listen to this. He says this. He said, He, Jesus, was humble and that he first took the form of a human and not the form of a more glorious creature like an angel. He was humble and that he was born into an obscure, oppressed place rather than a palace. He was humble and that he was born into poverty and born among a despised people. He was humble in that he was born as a child instead of appearing as a king. He was humble in submitting to the obedience to his parents in a household. He was humble in learning and practicing a trade, the humble trade of a carpenter. He was humble in the long wait until he launched out in his public ministry. He was humble in the companions and the disciples that he chose. He was humble in the audience he appealed to and the way that he taught. He was humble to the temptations that he allowed and endured. He was humble in the weakness, the hunger and thirst and tiredness that he endured. He was humble in his total obedience to his heavenly Father. He was humble in his submission to the Spirit of God. He was humble in choosing and submitting to death on a cross. He was humble in the agony of his death. He was humble in the shame and the mocking and the public humiliation of his death. And he was humble in enduring the spiritual agony of his sacrifice on the cross. He humbled himself in obedience to God, even to death, death on a cross. Why did he humble himself to death on a cross? Listen to this. In the Roman world, crucifixion was so shameful. It was not permitted for Roman citizens to speak about crucifixion out loud in public. That's how shameful it was. And to people uh, from Jesus' own race, Jewish, in their own scriptures, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, a victim of crucifixion was considered to be cursed by God. Cursed is one who hung on a tree. You know what the death of Jesus shows us and that humility shows us? The death of Jesus on the cross shows us there is no limit to what God will endure to demonstrate His love for His people. There is no limit. Jesus loved us to the utmost. God would take the most horrific symbol of shame, a cross. And now when people look at a cross, we don't see shame. We see what? Life, hope, mercy, and grace. Jesus humbled himself. And it led to life. Church, this is the mind of Christ. Paul lays out for us what it looks like to live as a citizen of heaven and to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. We must have the mind of Christ. And what does the mind of Christ look like? It looks like humility and it looks like serving. This is the mind of Christ. It looks like obedience to what God commands. And when we choose this better way of humility and obedience and serving God and others, when we choose this better way, even the things that are meant for evil, God can turn them for good. Even the things that were meant to bring us shame, God can bring glory from. This is the power of the mind of Christ. And if we truly want to live in a way worthy of the gospel, you truly want to honor Jesus. It's going to be found in humility, obedience, and serving. So let me just close with this question. You can come back, Hunter or Haley. Let me just ask this question. Based on what we've talked about 
and learn today. Ask yourself, do I have the mind of Christ? Do I have the mind of Christ? Am I humble? Am I looking for the needs of others to serve, to meet needs? Am I walking in obedience to the things that God has commanded? Do I have the mind of Christ? And if the answer is, it's not where it needs to be, I'm walking in a different way, then hear this as good news and encouragement today. This is a great opportunity for us to repent of that. Repent just means a change of mind with a change of direction. Today, what we can do is recognize we're chasing the wrong things for life. Now we're going to turn and chase the better things for life, the way of Jesus. Humility, serving, obedience to God. This is where life to the full is found. If we want the mind of Christ, that's what it looks like. So if that's not currently happening in your life, I would encourage you today. First, confess that to God. And then know this, that when you confess your faults to God, He is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. This is what 1 John 1, 9 tells us. He's faithful to forgive. I mean, think about this. Jesus' love is self-giving, co-suffering, and radically forgiving. It really knows no limits. Because as Jesus is dying on the cross... Do you know what comes out of his mouth towards the people, his enemies who are crucifying him? Father, forgive them. Come home today. Let's stop chasing all of these things that we think are going to give us life. And when we finally get them, we know there's something missing. Let's come back to the better way today. This is what he's calling us to. Listen, there's no guilt in coming back to Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He doesn't care how you get there. He just wants you to come back to life. I would encourage you to do that today. Confess the things that are standing between you and Him. It would usually be our sin and our selfish ways. Confess that. Ask for forgiveness. And He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. You'll be brand new today. And then when you leave this place... Start following and walking in the better way of Jesus. What does that look like? Humility, serving, and obedience. That's where the life is. Amen? So whether today for the first time or the first time in a long time, or today you just need to confess some things to God, I would invite you to confess that. Our sin separates, but God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself. A way has been made. Confess Him as Lord. Believe in your heart. You'll be saved, forgiven, made brand new. So right where you are, you don't need me to pray for you for that. You go before God and confess those things. Confess Him as Lord. Tell Him you believe. Ask for forgiveness. And God is faithful to meet you where you are. Amen? Take a few moments and make your decisions that you need to make. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to be gathered today. What a privilege it is for the people of God to gather, to serve one another, to sing praises together to our God, to share in Scripture together, to be encouraged, to be challenged, and to be renewed and forgiven. Thank you for the life that we can find in you. And God, I pray that as a people, individually, but also corporately together as a church, Help us to be a people who are humble. Help us to be a people who serve. And help us to be a people who are marked by taking very seriously the commands that you have given us. And if we'll just do the one thing that you've commanded us to do, to love people the way that you have loved us, we would have done everything Scripture commands.
But God, help us to walk in humility and obedience and help us to look for ways to serve others. God, I believe one of the greatest ways to break selfishness in our lives is to do something for someone else. So help our eyes to be open. You're always providing opportunities. Help us to look with new eyes to see the opportunities that are in front of us. Thank you for this day, the privilege to gather, and I pray blessing over your people in the name of Jesus. Amen.